we can synthesize conjugated dienes using a lot of the reactions you've already seen in organic chemistry one. They're readily prepared, for example, using elimination reactions. And because they're particularly stable, and we'll dig into this and the reasons why and how we know this a little bit later, but due to that special stability, conjugated systems can often form preferentially when other possibilities exist. And we'll see an example of this on this slide. So for example, to synthesize 1,3-butadiene, this molecule with four carbons and two double bonds in a conjugated arrangement, we could take potassium terpbutoxide, which we know is a strong, bulky base that promotes elimination, and you probably wouldn't even need to heat this to get this to go. There's a beta hydrogen in the starting material here, which is an allylic bromide. That beta hydrogen to the bromo group can be eliminated by the bulky base in an E2 elementary step, and the result is this conjugated diene. Now here, pretty much the conjugated diene is the only possibility, right? Um, there's no other possible elimination that could take place here. The bottom case is a little bit more interesting in that respect. So we see here, again, we're using potassium terpbutoxide as a base and trying to achieve elimination to the conjugated diene, 1,3-butadiene. We've got now two sets of beta hydrogens on the outer methyl groups there, and elimination of these leads to the two double bonds that you see. So elimination of H and BR on the left gives one double bond, elimination of H and BR on the right gives another double bond. But something interesting that we can notice here is that there is another set of beta hydrogens with, with respect to each bromo group, right? These two hydrogens in purple are technically beta to the bromine on the carbon next door, right? And elimination of those would lead not to a conjugated diene, but to an alkyne, right? We could imagine eliminating, for example, this H and this bromine, that would establish a double bond here. Eliminating this H and this bromine would then establish the triple bond, but none of that is observed. And one of the reasons why is this conjugated system is relatively stable, so elimination occurs preferentially to give the 1,3-butadiene as opposed to the alkyne. Now, at the bottom here, we have an interesting observation about bond length in conjugated dienes. The CC single bond in conjugated dienes is actually shorter than a typical sp3, sp3 carbon-carbon bond in something like ethane. So on the right, we have the molecule ethane, two methyl groups. Keep in mind here that the methyl group is CH3 or H3C. It's equivalent to a methyl group, so this molecule is CH3, CH3 just about as vanilla a sigma bond as you can imagine. And on the left here, we have 1,3-butadiene. And notice that the 1,3-butadiene is actually a little bit shorter. That central single, single bond between the two carbons highlighted in purple is a little bit shorter than the CC bond in ethane. This suggests, and other experiments and other data bears this out, that there's some carbon-carbon double bond character in that apparent single bond between the inner carbons of 1,3-butadiene. We'll see why this is. To get a sense of it and start thinking about it, we can begin to think about the possibility of resonance in this molecule. And I encourage you to pause the video and try to draw a resonance structure of this molecule that shows that this central CC apparent single bond actually has some double bond character. This helps us rationalize the shorter bond length, right? Because with the double bond, the bond is a little bit stronger than a plain vanilla CC single bond. And with that additional double bond character, that's going to make the bond a little bit shorter as well. If you look at dienes that are conjugated as a whole relative to a comparable isolated diene, it becomes apparent that the conjugated diene as a whole is more stable than the isolated diene or alkenes. And to show this, for example, we can look at reactions where an alkene or an isolated diene goes to the same product as a conjugated diene and look at the enthalpy or energy changes associated with these reactions. And heat of hydrogenation is a great context for this. So imagine we started with two moles, let's say, of this alkene right here. We treated that with hydrogen gas, H2, such that those two hydrogens added to the alkene. This is a reaction you've seen before, hydrogenation of alkenes. That's gonna lead in this particular case to butane, which is the molecule 
down here. Now imagine that we took not two moles, but one mole of a molecule in which this CC single bond has become a double bond. That's 1,3-butadiene. And we again treated that with hydrogen gas such that two equivalents of H2 added to the alkene. This leads to the same product. Notice that this is butane, right? Adding hydrogens here and here and here and here is going to lead to butane, the same product. When we do these two experiments, and we do, for example, calorimetry to measure the enthalpy change associated with these processes, we find that for the two moles of alkene, isolated alkene, the enthalpy change is negative 60.7 kilocalories. However, when we do the same experiment with 1,3-butadiene, we find that the enthalpy change is now only negative 57.1 kilocalories per mole of butadiene. So it's apparent that there's an energy gap or enthalpy gap, if we want to be a little more careful here, between the isolated alkenes and the conjugated diene. And that gap is about 3.6 kilocalories per mole based on this experiment. We can think of this 3.6 kilocalories per mole as the stabilization energy of the conjugated system relative to isolated alkenes or an isolated diene. This number is going to come back again. We're actually going to get additional evidence for this value as the stabilization energy of 1,3-butadiene uh, in particular. But it gives you a sense of how much stability you get from conjugation. About 3.5 kilocalories per mole is a good benchmark to keep in mind. And if you're familiar, for instance, with the relationship between activation energy and rate, or the relationship between the thermodynamic free energy change and the equilibrium constant, you can get a sense of how much this makes a conjugated diene more favorable or more stable than an isolated diene. Um, this gives us a sense of the stability of conjugated dienes. And this is actually substantial. It may not look like much, but remember, this energy value depends or is related exponentially to equilibrium constants and rate constants. So a few kilocalories per mole goes a long way to favor the conjugated system over isolated alkenes or an isolated diene.